Welcome to the Breakup Recovery Podcasts by your host, Barbara Stevens. Discover the wisdom and remarkable insights of Barbara Stevens, breakup recovery mentor, author, and public speaker. Barbara offers programs and solutions for any breakup so you can turn your life around, create lasting changes for the better, and embrace life again. Hello and welcome to Breakup Recovery. My name is Barbara Stevens and I'm a Breakup Recovery Mentor. In today's episode, I welcome Eric Newton, a former family law attorney who has built a new career where he now helps couples build healthy relationships and a place where couples can go for information and inspiration. Eric describes himself as someone who has been through a thousand divorces and still believes in love. So welcome, Eric. Hi, thank you. Really, thanks, Barbara. It's nice to be here. So, Eric, as a divorce lawyer, what lessons did you learn in regards to marriage and divorce? Oh, so many. <laughs> so, where do I begin? You know, actually, I just wrote an article series about this where I, I plucked out my top 16 lessons that I learned from divorce. But uh, let me see if I can start with the my favorites. I believe that in relationships, there's a large focus on avoiding conflict and that actually it's the conflict that is our greatest opportunity to create depth. And in the divorce context, ironically, I saw so many couples create intimacy with one another through the process of getting divorced that they didn't have access to before because they were so worried about avoiding the conflict during the marriage. And so that's one of the biggest lessons I've taken from the whole process. Eric, what do you mean by intimacy? Ah, great question. So, you know, to me, intimacy is really about understanding the universe that our partners live in. Because we all have our, you know, we all have this reality that we have created for ourselves that we think of as objective, but really fundamentally our perspectives and our opinions and our reactions to the inputs of the world, they're subjective. They're unique to each of us individually. And that's the beauty of relating. You know, that's the beauty of coming into contact with other people is having our own perspectives cracked open and, and in some sense our minds blown by the variety and the surprising beauty of everyone else's view of the world. And sometimes it's terrifying. You know, we see that right now in the U.S. in our political environment. It's quite scary. But it's also awakening. And it's our opportunity to learn more about ourselves and our partners, to step into their universe and understand who they are, where they come from, what they care about, and then to love them for it, even if it's sometimes challenging. I think when you're going through a divorce, that is a challenge to to think about how the other person is thinking and why they're thinking that way and to jump into their thought process because when we're going through a divorce, we're very narcissistic in some way. We're just interested in what we're going to do in the future, where we're going to head, how we're going to separate, where we're going to live. All those things about us is what we're thinking about in a divorce. So how did you get couples to change their thought process and think about the other person? I don't know if I actually did during my time as a divorce lawyer. You know, when couples would come into my office, I would certainly begin the conversation from the perspective of uh, how could they approach this gracefully in a way that they would be proud when they looked back on it in five or ten years after the emotion had passed? That was the context that we always wanted to set for the conversation. But to be honest, people who are coming into a divorce lawyer's office, they're looking to end the relationship. They're not looking as much, or at least they don't know that they're looking for emotional perspective. And so... It was a little bit more difficult at that time to have that conversation. But that was a perspective we started from at the very least, was how can you look back at this and be proud of it? 
that is a great way for a divorce lawyer to talk to his clients because don't often think of divorce in that way, do you? No, most people don't. And I recall a lot of uh, of our clients would would express how grateful they were for our general perspective for that and for our focus on de-escalating the conflict whenever possible and also transparency. The other lesson that we learned about keeping the divorce as amicable as possible is to be militant about transparency. You know, the worst case scenario has already come to pass. You're, you are getting a divorce. Well, that might not, I, I don't know if that's fair to say it's always the worst case scenario, but for many people that is. And the, the divorce is already happening and the relationship is already ending or transitioning in some sense. And so there's really nothing left to lose. It's this great opportunity to be courageous. And we are, we're often, we're so scared about expressing our true selves, our true desires. And also we, we hold our cards close to our vest with regards to finances and our true intentions usually for these very abstract reasons during the relationship in the divorce that gets mutated that instinct gets mutated into this uh, this intention to remain safe you know to protect your your assets or your family or your children and really really what we found over and over and over is to just if you just put your cards on the table if you disclose everything that you want and that you need, if you share all of your financial realities, then it creates this extraordinary environment of trust where people can work together to create a future that they can both live with. So that was a long way of answering your question, wasn't it? <laughs> Sorry about that. It's great advice, Eric. It's great advice for people who are going through a divorce to try and think that way. So what other things did you learn? as a divorce attorney? You know, one of my favorite lessons is this notion that you can win any fight that you're in if you're willing to be stubborn or crazy enough, but that it's almost never worth it. You know, w when we're in a dispute, there's this opportunity that we have to stand for our convictions in a way that leaves no room for negotiation or interaction with another person, right? And that, you know, that kind of stubbornness is so overwhelmingly irrational for most humans that it's not worth fighting with. And a lot of people will just give up in the face of that kind of overwhelming stubbornness. And that's fine. You can win a fight by doing that, but you lose any chance of having a true human interaction with that person from there forward. You're never going to negotiate it. You're never going to work on something together. You're never going to create something together. You're always going to be opposed to one another. And there's a real benefit in long-term value to just giving up sometimes, to giving up your, your position a tiny bit, to compromise. Oh, definitely, especially when there's children involved and you know that you're going to have some sort of connection with the other person for quite some time. Yeah, absolutely. Yes, uh, that's such a perfect example. It's the, the co-parenting context is where the rubber really meets the road with the stuff. It can be just, you know, a lot of this stuff is just theoretical claptrap until you actually have to stay in relationship because of children. I'm happy to say that most of our clients really do step up to the plate in the context of the kids. Every once in a while, you'll see the horror stories, but you know people love their kids. They really do. They want what's best for their kids. And the research has shown over and over and over, overwhelmingly, that the success of children of divorced parents is directly proportional to the degree to which those parents can get along. So after the divorce, if the parents can actually have a civil conversation, the kids are going to do a lot better. And, you know, sometimes you just got to swallow your pride and just have a civil conversation because it's the right thing to do for your kids. And I know you're right. And I know you have lots of evidence for why the other person is wrong and they were terrible to you and they need to be told and somebody needs to teach them a lesson. But really, 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 what really matters is the health of your children. 
and they're going to do better if you can get along. They're not going to do so well if you're always right, if you keep fighting. That's definitely right. Eric, tell me more about what you actually do now. Well, now I host a podcast called Together, which is a series of interviews with real couples about the truth of their relationships. Um, you know, what I try to do is get below the fluff and PR that people have about how perfect their relationships are and get down to what's really going on in order to, uh, to kind of reduce the shame that we all feel about having challenges sometimes. So the podcast is just a series of interviews with couples. And then the magazine is, uh, which together magazine, which is the, the companion to the podcast is a series of articles from journalists and therapists and normal people who've had revelations about their relationships and share those, uh, on the, on the magazine. So that's what I do today is I, I just host these two kind of content producing mechanisms and it's the most fulfilling thing I have ever done in my life, Barbara. Why do you think we argue or fight with the ones that we love? Ah, yeah, one of my other favorite topics. So, well, two answers to that. I fundamentally, deep down at the bottom, it's this concept of fear. You know, you're fighting because you think there's something to protect. You think something is at risk. And probably unconsciously, uh, you believe that a fight is your last best effort to protect that thing. That's the first answer. and. That's my favorite component of it because there's this constant opportunity to dig down and explore what the heck we think is so important that we need to fight. What is at risk? I just love that question. And exploring that question oftentimes causes the emotions around the fight to melt away if you can do it. So that's the first answer. Uh, I have a second, in le but I, I thought I heard you... Uh, begin to say something. Did you want to say something about that? It's, oh. a, it's a very interesting concept, isn't it? If you can actually step away from an argument and think about what your emotions are and what your fear is and why you are fighting about the thing you're actually fighting about. I don't think we often do that. No, we don't. And it is a skill. I mean, that is not something that is done easily. It, to, when we're in the midst of that, when we're having that fear reaction and we're fighting, it's instinctive. You know, our fight or flight mechanism has kicked in and it is controlling us, you know, the amygdala part of the brain. And it takes a muscle to be able to calm that down and back away from the conflict in the moment so that you can stop and inquire. But it's that process. I mean, that's the process that leads us to the intimacy that we were talking about earlier. It's understanding your internal mechanism, what was so scary, and then sharing that with your partner so that they can see, oh, yeah, I, I maybe I disagree with you, but I get that you thought that was scary, and I don't want you to feel scared. You know, I mean, that's when we really get down to it, that's, that's at the core of every conflict conversation is there's some fear, and we just need to share that with our partner and have it be voiced. So the second part is that. It's this notion that... We fight because we're trying on some level to connect and to create intimacy. Uh, there's a very famous relationship therapist named Harville Hendricks who has a, a school of couples therapy called Imago Therapy. And his view, which is just so elegant, is that we come together with our partners in order to drive up our unresolved unconscious challenges. You might refer to them as our core wounds from childhood. And that when we're in an intimate relationship with one another, we, in both directions, because we're underneath our armor, we trigger one another's deepest issues. Then those issues come up, and it's our, I think of it as our sacred duty in a relationship to be there to heal those core wounds with one another. Because we're, we're triggering them and they come up and then we can heal them. And it's that process that causes emotional, spiritual, relational growth. And that looks like conflict. I mean, it feel, it, it is conflict, right? Because it, what comes up is the root of a conflict. So I think of that as the second reason that we fight with the ones we love. It's in order to heal ourselves and thereby create even more intimacy and depth. How do you find out what your 
your core issues are then? Well, I mean, that is the process of therapy or analysis or relationship coaching at its essence. It's this process of exploring what's going on for us underneath our conscious mechanisms so that we can better understand ourselves. And the how you do it is, you know, you just start by noticing what you're feeling. That's step number one, and it's the step that a lot of people just don't take. And it's the reason you're hearing in popular culture right now this common wisdom that you're supposed to feel your feelings. You know, have your feelings. If you're sad because you've, for example, recently gone through a breakup, don't avoid those feelings. Don't crush those feelings. Have them. You know, don't, don't get addicted to them, but have them. Have your feelings. Have your anger, your happiness, your sadness, whatever seems to be arising. And step one in understanding your unconscious mechanism is to observe those feelings, to observe them, to name them, to explore them and understand them, and then to inquire where are they coming from? You know, what's the root of any given experience? And usually in the therapist's office, we're talking about negative experiences, but the positive ones are useful too. And it's this process of exploring where these feelings are coming from that eventually digs down closer and closer to these unconscious roots. Now, I have to say, this is a very, very difficult process to do on your own, and this is why therapists are so extraordinarily useful, because they're trained to do this exact thing. You know, you can't see the back of your head without a mirror, and you really can't explore your unconscious mechanisms without the help of somebody who's neutral, an expert, or otherwise. But that's the general process. Do you think that people, if they don't explore these feelings and don't get down to the core issues, that they take it from one relationship to the next if they don't do anything about them? Oh, definitely. What you're insinuating is so absolutely right on. And I can tell you that in the divorce context, I would observe my clients who went and did the work, the emotional work to clear out the the damage and the baggage that had come up in their first marriage always invariably had healthier second marriages or subsequent relationships when they were ready and that's because there's this great opportunity in a breakup to understand what was triggering us you know it it's not none of it's invalid it's all completely legitimate but the opportunity is to become aware of it i mean that's that's the golden ticket that we're being presented when we're facing a challenge like a breakup is to understand what's going on for us. And so people who would really do that work always came out happier, healthier, and um, stepped into even better relationships afterwards. On the other hand, you hear the statistics about second marriages being less or more prone to divorce than first marriages. And this is because a lot of people don't do that work. And then, of course, just as you said, they carry those issues forward with them, except now they have more evidence to prove that something's wrong and that, in fact, they are at risk and there is some real danger that they need to prevent. And so the fights in the future have even more weight and more heaviness and they're harder to get through. You know, Eric, it can be quite confronting to look at your emotions, to look at your issues, to look at the core things that are causing you so much unhappiness within relationships. It's quite confronting and it can be hard work because we don't want to acknowledge that, you know, maybe we are at fault in some way in the demise of any of our relationships. Oh, yes, it's so true. You know, though, it's also true that the harder we hold on the more painful it is, the harder we hold on to some static old way of being, the more we suffer as the world changes around us. The analogy I think about this frequently is skateboarding or surfing. Have you ever, have you ever spent any time on a skateboard or surfboard? Definitely on a board, yes, in the ocean. On a board of some kind. Right, okay. So you understand. There's this phenomenon whereby if you allow the speed of the board and the wave to be exactly what it is. If you pop up and you go with the manifest speed that's there, 
you have balance, you have ease, you have flow, right? Yeah. But there's this phenomenon at the beginning when anybody's learning how to ride some kind of a board, snowboard, skateboard, whatever, where they're scared of the speed, and rightly so, right? It's terrifying. There's consequences to falling at speed. But they're scared of the speed, and they try to pull it back in one way or another, and invariably they ca- that actually causes a crash. And it's when you go with the speed that you have flow, and you don't crash, and you have a lot more fun. I liken that to the experience of our emotions in life. You know, we are having these emotions, and we're going to have them regardless of whether we try to ignore them or quash them or avoid them by watching television too often or taking drugs or whatever or starting new relationships. We've got these emotions, and we've got fear, and we've got exhilaration, and we've got possibility. We've got all of it. It's this giant wave of the emotional life and if we allow it to be what it is you know just allow that wave to go just go with the emotion everything tends to work itself out it works out fine it's when we try to resist it when we try to hold ourselves down that's when we get hurt that's when we suffer i totally agree with you eric where can people find more about what you do and what you can offer well, our website is at together.guide. That's G-U-I-D-E, which actually is a domain extension these days. So together.guide. And that's where you can find our magazine and our list of podcasts. And um, from there, you can click through to your favorite podcast player, iTunes or Stitcher or what have you. And uh, I love hearing from folks. So By the way, if any of your listeners want to listen to the show and reach out and tell me what you think, I would just be pleased and honored, so don't be shy. Thank you, Eric, for making the time to be here with us today on Breakup Recovery and sharing some of your great insights about when you were in a divorce attorney and what you offer now and talking about people dealing with their issues, their core issues, so that when they go into the next relationship, it can be better not only for them, but to the other person. So thank you again, Eric, for sharing. Thanks, Barbara. It's a real pleasure to be here. I appreciate you having me on the show. If you would like to hear previous Breakup Recovery podcasts, visit barbarastevens.com.au. Connect with Barbara Stevens on social media with Barbara Stevens Breakup Recovery Mentor on Facebook and at You'll Be Okay on Twitter. Read further blogs, view webinar replays, and download your free ebook, Three Easy Steps to Surviving Your Breakup, and much more at barbarastevens.com.au.